Welcome back, dear audience. We're back again. Yes. Me, Åsa Ström Hildestrand and... Vajda Rajitite. <laughs> and we are here to uh, do our Nordic tour and hear from our local and regional experts on this topic. But first, we'll of course like to look at the Menti results. So here are the results. Yes, it seems that most of you feel that the session is interesting, the you feel the collaboration spirit, as well you feel informative and uh, there's a lot of different uh, expressions that you think about lifelong learning, the young, young people, uh, structural changes, social skills, social upgrade, importance and many, many other words you type in here uh, thank you so much for contributions and don't forget to post questions for the upcoming speakers yes because uh, now when we uh, uh, start our uh, nordic tour uh, we'll also uh, uh, try and make room for questions as we move along uh, so we'll uh, have five speakers uh, and learn from their uh, their uh, work at the regional and local level but first of all, we're actually uh, visit um, the leader of one of our thematic groups on resilient regions. And she has more of a helicopter perspective. So let's go to Norway. So very welcome to the program, Bigitte Wolsem. You are the leader of our Nordic thematic group on resilient regions, and you are very uh, preoccupied with this topic of today and one of the architects behind the program. Uh, so we're looking forward to hear your comments on the keynotes uh, and, of course, uh, from the from your perspective uh, as the leader of the thematic group uh, on this topic. Thank you, Osta. Thank you so much. I think uh, this uh, this seminar is really professional. <laughs> it's nice to uh, to participate. Uh, there, there are many things to comment. Um, Anna uh, Lundgren's uh, presentation was brilliant, and I I know the content quite well since we've been working together. Um, and uh, Sanon Skula also presented the Norwegian uh, skills policies. Uh, Yes. Extensively. Uh, you may think that this has been like that forever, but I will just add that in the last four or five years, we had a, a very uh, tremendous development in uh, political skills, both mm. at national and regional level. So it's a kind of new art in Norway. And we so should perhaps also mention that that's also, so it's not by chance that we have so much focus on Norway today, but it's of course no. because you've put so much effort into your new skills policy and you've developed Skills Norway as a specific entity for this. But I'm also very curious because you, you're actually, you're a senior uh, advisor at the, uh, or analyst at the Ministry of, of uh, Local Government and Modernization. And you're one of the, the uh, brains behind this new uh, skills policy and part of the implementation, of course. So how does the ministry support the regions in this? And what are the, the main tools that, that you see that, that will be effective, sort of looking forward with the implementation of this new policy? I mean, besides what we heard from Sveinung uh, already. I think uh, first we, we are a team in the ministry that is working quite a lot with these uh, questions. And I think Perhaps the most important thing is to get acknowledge at the national level in the government that the regional and local level is so important mm -hmm. when it comes to skills policies. Yeah. Because uh, as, you, as we were told, uh, the regions are so different, the needs are so different. So that has been a struggle to really get the uh, legit legitimacy and the acknowledge from the government mm -hmm. and the different ministries that you have to empower the regional level so they can do their work uh, targeted at the regional and local level. Mm. So we were helped by the regional reform, giving more yeah. power to the regional level. But I think that's a very important uh, statement that <laughs> you need 
uh, in, uh, you need a government to agree in principle. And then you can start building on with measures, policies. Mm -hmm. You can empower the actors. They will get acknowledged. They will feel important and they will then start to work mm. and skill themselves mm. in this uh, fine art of or developing the right uh, skills for the right future. Mm. So this it's is a so matter of leadership. You need. It's As... a matter of leadership, but it's a matter of uh, of um, of um, of principles being acknowledged mm. by the government and and also by uh, this uh, directorate uh, mm. uh, that Skula comes from mm. to acknowledge that this is important to reach you know the different target groups. Mm. So the national bodies seems to be uh, often very occupied by themselves mm -hmm. and the very national perspectives. But if you get them to acknowledge that there is a reality down there, we have to reach the small and medium-sized enterprises uh, at the local level, the youth, the uh, uh, you know, all kinds of target groups. We have to reach them with, uh, with uh, skills uh, supply. Mm. Uh, then you can start building policies and measures. So I would That's like to also important. ask you, I know that lifelong learning is, is a very important aspect that you're promoting. Uh, how, how would you, uh, how would you uh, uh, say that that's been perceived at the regional level? Do you have any specific regions that you could highlight that have, have uh, really you know, taken steps forward and, and started to, to implement this? Yes, I would think that uh, we have. Um, we Anna talked about the regional ecosystems of skilled uh, or competence actors, and I think that is uh, extremely important. And and we have an example in the, at the west coast, uh, Vestland, mm -hmm. the county of Vestland, uh, other places as well. But they were in forefront, uh, and they managed to uh, to uh, the county municipality managed to gather all. The important actors and players in the region, even university and and university colleges, mm -hmm. which is normally quite difficult mm -hmm. to to uh, to get into a kind of county municipality context. Mm. So they really managed to make a a, a forum mm -hmm. as well, a forum mm -hmm. uh, where the system, where they're in a very systematic way work with skills challenges in their region all mm. the actors together mm. and then they get powerful they say that they have they share the voice so the voice is important also to the national level mm -hmm. uh, you know they become important mm. uh, so that is um uh, that is uh, that has been a, a tremendous development i would say the last four years yeah. and then the other county municipalities are coming after Right. So there's I'm also a way, the of course, to share share the good practice between the municipalities. I was also curious, the, how do you do you see digitalization? Do you see it as a blessing or a curse? Or how can you use uh, the digitalization as a force for change and for for uh, providing uh, trainings, for example? Well, d digitalization is a is a blessing uh, when it comes to decentralized and flexible education for many people, because you can join in wherever you are, at your cabin on the mountain, everywhere you can join the, 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 the lessons and, 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 and do your work. But uh, I think that, so, so that is good, because it's getting accessible for everybody. But there are many people that are not uh, used to study. They're not mm -hmm. independent. They, they cannot study, have, don't have the experience to sit uh, and work uh, in a very uh, independent way. Mm. So there are many of these uh, groups, especially perhaps in rural areas, mm. and they need an infrastructure or an environment. They need people around, they need mm. some coaching, combining digitalization and, and meeting other students and teachers, getting inspired, getting through the program. Mm. So it's not a blessing for uh, everybody. Yeah. And you see a need for a combination then of, of the digital tools, but also have, have enough people to do the coaching and mentoring and teaching, uh, which would also provide jobs then uh, also in the rural areas if you, if you have that, I guess. Well, there's a lack of teachers uh, in the rural areas, so it will be a challenge. But, but uh, yes, uh, I think a combination has to be flexible. It has mm. to suit people. So some 
prefer to go to the campus and and, and follow everything there yeah. and other individuals they like to to study uh, uh, more in, in a digital way. Mm. So we have to, it's getting more complex. We have to be more flexible. Those are the key words for today, I think. Complex and <laughs> flexible, besides digitalization <laughs> and maybe COVID. Thank you so much, Begitte, for, for uh, joining us on the program today. And I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more from you in the future because your thematic group will now sort of re uh, reform itself and, and uh, get started with a new four-year collaboration program in, in the coming year. So thanks again uh, for contributing. And then our next trip goes to Åland. All right, welcome to the program, Jukko Kinnunen. You are the head of research at Åland Statistics and Research. Uh, we all know that Åland has been hit very hard by COVID-19 as the ferry traffic has shrunk to a minimum and tourism uh, with that. Uh, so Jukko, please give us an, a picture of the situation uh, in Åland right now and how to move forward. Uh, where are you heading? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, you are absolutely right. Um, Åland is one of the hardest hit uh, regions in, in, in uh, Finland when it comes to Corona restrictions. Not so much uh, much with the Corona itself. We have, have had very few uh, cases of, of COVID-19. So uh, the, the restrictions of free movement have uh, struck a real, really hard blow on uh, the, the uh, heart of the Åland economy that is... Uh, how, how does it look in, in measurements in terms of unemployment and, and uh, GDP growth? What do you see? Well, we are calculating at, at our statistical office that uh, we uh, will have like uh, 10 percent, uh, 9, 10 percent uh, annual uh, uh, unemployment rate this year, which has never been seen before in, in Orland. Oh, it's, wow. it's like the triple the normal rate. Uh, when it comes to GDP, we think that we will lose 16 percent of, of GDP compared to 2019. And this is also a drop that we haven't seen before. Uh, how how important would you say that Nordic collaboration uh, is for Åland and and well your relation to to the outside world? So we really uh, live on 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 uh, free uh, movement and and, and uh, cooperation with the Nordic regions. Uh, we need the Swedes to come over and and and, and enjoy their life with us. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Finns have been able to, to, to visit us this summer and it has really saved some of, the, some of our businesses from, mm. from going bankrupt uh, already. But we are waiting with, the, uh, well, uh, with some hope that the next summer will be better. But if it's not, we are in really dire straits. Mm -hmm. And is this specifically uh, the tourism industry that's been hit hard or has it also sort of spilled over to other key sectors in the economy? Well, the tourism itself, it's, it's uh, kind of hidden in, uh, in many different industries. But uh, of course, uh, hotels and restaurants and, and, and transports are the most badly hit. Mm. Actually, in, when it comes to, uh, for example, retail trade, uh, we see that the, there has been some decline, but it's not so dramatic. There's mm -hmm. another side of the coin, namely that uh, we Hollanders love to go shopping to Sweden. Mm -hmm. And that has been very difficult this year. Ah, yeah. So we spend more money uh, locally. Mm. 
So that outweighs a little bit, or at least counteracts this, this uh, sharp uh, decline. Uh, so uh, if you look at COVID from the different perspective, do you see any ways that you could use uh, the COVID situation to, to boost the digitalization and business uh, innovation in, in Åland? And also the focus that we already talked about here today with upskilling. How, how, how do you see that? Or do you see that happening in Åland right now? I think many companies have been looking for kind of uh, new ideas to 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 uh, find find new business and and, and of course uh, here as well in other places we have uh, uh, leapfrogged uh, ahead when it comes to using using digital tools in in meeting people and uh, I think that in the in the longer uh, term. Uh, this may be a, a, a bit of a blessing that maybe people understand that, for example, they can live here and, and uh, work towards uh, Stockholm and Helsinki even more than we have some people doing it already. And maybe we see more people uh, uh, wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you see the same happening in terms of education or that young people can now stay in Åland but still follow education programs at universities in Finland or Sweden, for example, or other places? Well, uh, when it comes to uh, education, higher education, uh, a lot of youngsters leave for Sweden or, or Finland for studies. During these corona times, we have had some, some of our youngsters to come home and, and uh, continue studying towards their universities in, in, in the mainland, Finland or, or Sweden. But uh, the main uh, pattern, I think, is that, that, the, that, that our students are uh, at, the university, uh, at the university cities and, and visit home uh, less frequently. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a sharp or a big difference there. Uh, I was also curious, I mean, we talked a little bit about the green transition, and I know that, that you have a, a, an ambitious plan for Åland 2030 and to, to uh, yeah, trans transition into a more sustainable society. Do you think this, uh, this program or these plans will be accelerated also through or with the help of the digitalization that is happening now? Or would you like to comment on that as well? Uh yeah, uh, I think there have been a lot of uh, policy discussions at the national and international level that that uh, kind of uh, promotes the idea that the green trans transition should be the way out of this uh, COVID uh, recession. And uh, I, I'm happy happy to uh, welcome that mm -hmm. if, if it is the case. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think the, the, the companies here are just uh, very keen on surviving and and the, the 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 more longer term plans are kind of put aside i i think that's mm -hmm. the the more realistic uh, 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 way of, of of describing the situation okay but uh, for example the eu funds if if we get what we expect to get from the national uh, allocation here to regional uh, level i think it will boost uh, the green transition mm -hmm. quite uh, considerably mm -hmm. And, and when it comes to, to upskilling then, because I can imagine that green transition also requires lots of upskilling in the local companies, for example. Do you see that the government of Holland has, uh, has taken any specific steps in that regard to, to help with, uh, with the skills provision, so to speak, or help companies with the upskilling uh, to, to be able to, to uh, take these steps in, uh, in the green transition? Uh, I would say that uh, we have seen some interesting uh, initiatives uh, that have tackled the, the current crisis. For example, they have, there was a kind of a uh, very, uh, sh at very short notice, there was a conversion courses for those who had uh, nursing uh, education but were working on board uh, the vessels, passenger vessels. Mm -hmm. They could update their skills and, and start working at the local hospital or in elderly care while they were uh, furloughed from, from the shipping companies. Mm -hmm. And we also see that uh, these needs uh, youngsters have yeah. been uh, uh, kind of, uh, 
there's a, there's a project uh, starting where they are kind of uh, trained to work within care, elderly care, where they see uh, uh, get a, a bit of a training and, and kind of a taste of that kind of work, and they can then uh, think uh, what are their further steps. But uh, there are all kinds of small, mm -hmm. they're quite small initiatives, but there are, there are plentiful uh, new ideas going on. Well, I think that's nice. So we end on a bit of a hopeful note, despite the sort of the dire situation overall, you still see that there, there is creativity and there are, are ways uh, forward, sounds like. Yes. Uh, for example, in the hospitality uh, uh, industry also, I see that uh, hotels and restaurants, they are luring the, the local inhabitants to stay overnight uh, in, 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 in their lodgings and kind of selling this weekend, weekend uh, packages. And um, I think that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you so much, Yuku, for, for sharing this uh, image of, of life in Åland right now and the prospects for the future. Thank you so much for being on the program. And our next trip goes back to Sweden. Yes, very welcome to the program, Maria Edvardsson. You're a, a coordinator at the vocational SFE school in Karlstad municipality, SFE standing for Swedish for Immigrants. And as we also saw in this, uh, this uh, jingle or this little introduction video, uh, Sweden is becoming a very uh, multi-colored and diverse society. And you work in the middle of that and you've dis developed a very successful form of integrated language and vocational training for refugees to Kolsta and Värmland uh, region. And uh, since 2017, you've, you've worked with this uh, concept to beat unemployment and improve skills and matching in Kolsta. And uh, it's one of our case study regions as well that, that Anna presented earlier. And it's a mainly rural region uh, on the border to Norway. So with that introduction, Maria, please tell us more. What is special with this approach and, and what are the success factors? Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, the special thing about the vocational SFI is that it integrates learning Swedish with a vocational education. So our students, they can actually learn Swedish at the same time as they learn a profession. And this has proved to be very good for the students because uh, doing something practical and in an authentic situation uh, benefits their learning of language. Uh, and that is also how they have traditionally learned in their home countries. So that's one uh, success factor for us, that it's an authentic situation that we use for, for the learning. Mm. Um, I also know you work very closely with the labor market and, and the, the private sector actors that are looking for skills. Could you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Yes. Uh, before we start a new education, we always talk to the company companies because we really have to make sure there's a need for workers so we don't start uh, vocational SFI if there is not a need. So we have really good relationships with the companies uh, and the companies they work together with us. Uh, they provide internship uh, ships for our students so that at least 15% of the education is in a company. Right. And, and I also know that you've worked hard on the recruitment process to, to make sure you get the right students who are really motivated to learn a certain skill. I don't know if you could say something about that as well. Yes, uh, we actually put in uh, quite a lot of time in that process uh, because we want to pick the students that ha have uh, the right preconditions to start the um, vocational SFI programs. Um, and we, what we do is that we, we invite the students to practical tests uh, where we uh, set up different practical stations where they can test or try the, the parts of the profession. And what we do is that we look at how they follow instructions uh, and we also see what strategies they use to solve the problems they, they are faced with. 
Mm -hmm. So that gives us a lot of information about the students. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also test their knowledge of Swedish because we, we uh, start uh, working with the students on a very basic level, but we still require some, some basic level of Sweden, Swedish. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also make an interview uh, where we ask about the motivation. Uh, we ask about what they have been working with before uh, and try to, to identify uh, the students that are really motivated for this profession. And what are the results so far? I hear they're good, but uh, please tell us how good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so far the results are good, uh, at least before COVID, oh, the well. results were, were, yeah. really, were really good. Uh, so the first 24 students that finished uh, their vocational SFI, uh, out of the 24 students, uh, 22 got a job after the, the education. 22 out of 24. I think that's fantastic. Yes. And, and yes. Uh, which jobs were, were you training them for? Which, which uh, part or which branches or which part of the labor market? Uh, we were training chefs and we were training people to work in a hotel. Uh, and that's mainly why the results are bad mm. after COVID. Mm. Um, and then we were also training a vehicle painter and sheet metal workers for mm -hmm. the car industry. Mm. And, and what's, what's been the response so far from the employers? Are they also happy with their new employees? I mean, can you see that this really creates a good matching? Yes, they are really, they are really happy. Uh, in the beginning, they are a bit suspicious uh, because many employees are not used to working with people from another country. Uh, but when they meet our students and they see all the knowledge they, they have and all the motivation they have and the willingness to learn, they are often really impressed mm -hmm. and they, they find them uh, to be very good workers. Uh, are you able to, we also have a question for you uh, very soon uh, from the audience, but just one uh, final thing for me. Uh, so I'm also curious, are you uh, now going to uh, scale up and, and provide these uh, vocational uh, SFE across Värmland or, or what, what are the next steps? Uh, we are several several municipalities in Värmland working with vocational SFI, and for our educations, um, uh, students from all over Sweden can apply. So oh, yeah. we we work together with other municipalities in Värmland with our with our uh, education, and that is good because uh, it's uh, kind of hard sometimes to get the internships. So if we work together with the rest of Värmland, it's mm. easier for us, and it's it also uh, it's also easier for the students to get a job after the education they they finish their education. So good collaboration between the municipalities and within the region, but also across yes. regions. Then it sounds like yes. yeah, that's very yes. very interesting to hear. Vaida, we have a question. Yes, uh, so Maria, could you tell us a little bit more what is now on demand uh, in vocational education, and how does it fit the interest of the students? Uh, the, the vocational SFI we offer uh, right now is chef and we offer woodworker. Uh, we offer working with cars as a mechanic, uh, truck driver, um, also the vehicle painter and the sheet metal worker I talked about earlier, uh, hairdresser, for example. Uh, so we have a really, the students are really interested in, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our educations. And for the last one we started, we had 12 uh, positions and we had 72 people applying. So it's not uh, difficult to find students to, to apply for, for these uh, classes. So that was actually my, my final question here. How do you find the students and make sure to reach out also to, to people who are a bit marginalized or perhaps people who've been unemployed for a while? Uh, but you say this is not a problem. What, what, which are your main channels to, to reach your, your target audience? We go through all our networks, basically, and we, we uh, offer information in SFI. Mm -hmm. We have two SFI schools in uh, Karlstad, and we also spread the information to all the municipalities in Värmland. Mm -hmm. uh, so we work together uh, in a network. Uh, and then we go to the different places in Karlstad where, where people that are unemployed uh, are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we also go through Arbetsförmedlingen. Mm -hmm. So we try to use different channels because we don't want to reach only the people studying SFE. We want to learn, reach also people that um, can study SF, SFI but uh, have stopped for some reason. Mm, yeah, people who've, who've lived a longer time in Sweden but still uh, without a job. 
yes. Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. I think this is a very, you know, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And since this is one of the key issues uh, for the future of Sweden, uh, the matching and how to include uh, our immigrant uh, resources uh, into the labor market, I think you're, you're doing fantastic work here. And I hope that other municipalities and regions in Sweden and the Nordic countries will, will learn from you. And I, I hope we can come back to you also in the future. Thank you so much, Maria. And our next trip goes to Iceland. Oh, I really want to go to Iceland. I wish we could fly. Anyway, Sigurdur Olafsson, I hope you're with us now. Very welcome. Uh, you, you happen to be in Iceland, but, but here today you're actually representing uh, the West Nordic Council uh, as well, uh, since you're the Secretary General uh, of this regional collaboration body for Iceland, Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Uh, you have a special focus on, on youth uh, and skills uh, this year and the next. So uh, what, what does this mean in practice, uh, Sigurdur? And, and, uh, and uh, what are the key challenges and, and strengths that, you, that you're focusing on? Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for uh, casting light on the Western Nordic states, uh, Iceland, Greenland and the Faroe Islands. I would also love to visit Stockholm and Sweden now, so uh, <laughs> we could maybe have some mutual agreement. No, on that not in November. You don't want to come in November. <laughs> come in you the spring. Well. OK, I will. <laughs> Well, the West Nordic Council is actually maybe just a few, a very few explanations on what the West Nordic Council is. Yes, it's a, oh, of uh, course. It's, it's maybe, you could maybe simplify it by saying that it's a mini version of the Nordic Council. Uh, this is a parliamentary cooperation between the Faroe Islands, uh, I, Greenland and Iceland. Um, it comprises of 18 members, three from, uh, six from each parliament, from these three countries. And we have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have always... Um, had or for a long time had some theme that we pick and this time we actually picked this uh, theme of uh, the our young people in the west nordic states and uh, specifically in the rural areas and to be quite frank we were partly actually inspired by your report from north regio uh, reading about all the challenges from the young people of course we were aware of them uh, but uh, but uh, that helped us in our analytical work of, uh, of uh, casting light on uh, this very important theme. We have, of course, a very diverse group between the countries and uh, within the countries as well. But uh, this is always interesting for us, uh, for the parliamentarians and for the public uh, as, um, to, to uh, be able to compare within these uh, three, uh, in some ways similar, but in some other ways, very different uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And, and what what are you doing in practice? Are you is it a program where where uh, local organizations can apply for funds to work with needs, for example, or or work with youth empowerment or engagement, or what what are you doing in in practice? Well, unfortunately, we have no money to spend <laughs> but on, on on some process, but but we have our own agenda, so to speak. I mean, we uh, for example, we had a digital. Uh, so everything is digital now, obviously, but uh, but uh, we uh, were actually planning on a session on uh, the Arctic, count, uh, Arctic Circle uh, Assembly here in Reykjavik in October. But instead, we changed it into a uh, digital seminar, which can be uh, which is accessible actually still online, where we invited three uh, specialists or or people involved with uh, youth involvement uh, in October, where, where we broadcast from the Nordic House in Reykjavik. Um, and we will. Uh, we also had a program in the Faroe Islands in September, uh, but uh, and we will continue this winter. Hopefully, we we will be able, if the vaccine works, uh, sometimes during the spring, to to have uh, people with us in the audience, and and we very much hope that we will be able actually to actually to gather at a, uh, a conference in Southern Greenland in June next year where we will uh, broadly cast a light on this uh, very important um, um, theme of ours. So but, that but will be, um, yeah, 
Yeah. Sorry, but would you reach out to, to youth directly or would you work through youth organizations? Or I'm just curious about the, you know, the governance here, the, the, the outreach. How, how do you make change happen or how can you uh, encourage change? Exactly. I mean, we, we would like to be megalomaniac in the West Nordic Council, but yeah. we have to face the fact that we cannot change the world within the West Nordic Council itself. But uh, we will certainly try. Um, I mean, for a, a parliamentary cooperation, we have to stay on some kind of a meta level. Mm. I, we will not be able to uh, de deal with uh, some uh, uh, project that we've been hearing about today. So it's, it's more about... Um, uh, putting uh, things on the agenda mm -hmm. and uh, maybe compare between the three countries mm -hmm. what the solutions are. And, and uh, I think, uh, I mean, we have heard some very good examples today from, from the, uh, the Nordic states, from mm -hmm. Norway and then Holland and from other places. So uh, I think uh, it's more about uh, putting things on the agenda for mm -hmm. us as a, this political institute. Um, organization yeah hopefully you could also invite some other nordic regions then that have done some some good work on this and of course nordregio is always happy to help and and uh, come along as well and share some some uh, uh, knowledge on this topic uh, i think before i let you go here i would also love to have an update from from your icelandic perspective on iceland under covid i think uh, many are curious about uh, what happens in Iceland, Iceland that has, uh, where tourism has boomed to a level that was sort of unimaginable 10 years ago, and now there are no tourists anymore. Uh, could you give us a glimpse of how this has affected Iceland and, and what the steps forward are? Mm -hmm. I could maybe just tell you a little bit about, I mean, one of our lectures from in, in October was a person from the, the municipality of Akureyr, which is the... Uh, biggest uh, municipality uh, outside the Reykjavik mm. uh, metropolitan area, so, so to speak. And she, of course, touched upon um, uh, uh, working with young people and, and how unemployment, of course, has become a problem uh, in these areas. And of course, overall in Iceland, where uh, the uh, uh, most important industry has uh, all of a sudden just disappeared. Mm. Um, so uh, that, of course, poses a big problem in Iceland. But maybe we are in the same situation as in Ireland, that we really just hope that this is a temporary situation mm -hmm. and then we can, uh, we can turn back to uh, what quite normal circumstances already next year. But of course, we don't know mm. what the situation will be. But so, I also uh, I also hear, heard a lot that it wasn't super sustainable, perhaps the growth in tourism. So maybe it's also a, a way to recover a little bit from this super boom and then see how you can move forward in a more sustainable way. What would I know? Exactly. But yeah. you're trying to Im engage with youth then again and, and not leave them behind. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sigurdur, for, for uh, being on the program today, taking your time and, and sharing these, uh, these updates. And again, uh, hopefully we can continue our collaboration as well on this uh, important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Our final trip today goes to Denmark. And welcome to the program, Søren Melcher. You are a special advisor at the National Association of Municipalities. So, so you work uh, mainly with the local governments and the local level in, in Denmark. Uh, we know from our case study report uh, that Anna Lundgren presented earlier uh, that uh, one of the main challenges for, for the uh, capital region in Denmark at least is uh, the, the s uh, one of the skills challenges is the lack of skilled labor or skilled workers uh, in the more sort of practical fields. And, and a result uh, is, uh, this is a result of less students choosing a vocational education. And a parallel trend is an increasing unemployment among certain university graduates. So I'm really curious now that from your perspective at, at the Association of, of Local Governments, what, what do you think 
regions or municipalities uh, could do to change this situation? How, how could they influence youth to, to make educational choi choices that lead to employment? Uh, I know you work specifically with these issues, so please shed light on this. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and I'll try. <coughs> I partly work with um, um, with the the municipalities uh, in uh, in their efforts to um, to turn this picture around that you just um, laid out for us. Um, it is a long process, um, which uh, gives us. Uh, uh, which uh, entitles uh, on def different levels. There are both uh, the levels in the primary school. Um, what do we do uh, in order to affect the current uh, um, choices that the youth have? Um, what do we do mm -hmm. to enable them to see other mm -hmm. ways than just uh, gymnasium and higher education? Um, because that is, of course, not the best decision for everyone. Um, so there's a, a primary school level. And also there is uh, in Denmark, as I suppose there is in other Nordic countries, um, a, a, a group of uh, youth that does not move on to um, either uh, uh, education nor jobs. Um, that could be because of um, um, uh, mental illness. It could be because they haven't finished their primary school uh, and, and can get into uh, to, uh, youth education. Or it could um, be because that, that, uh, there's a, a lot of different reasons why. But mm -hmm. uh, we see that, um, that we have this group uh, for, uh, containing about 50,000 uh, youth, that um, which is a number that has been steady for a few years, mm. um, which is, of course, for the individual uh, young, um, uh, a very uh, unsafe place to be. Um, many of them um, uh, use drugs and um, are a, a criminal, uh, turn, turn to crime and so on and so forth because they have no other, uh, other place to belong. Um, so uh, about for, for this group specifically, um, we have uh, in, the, in the last couple of years made some drastic changes to, to what we do um, to enable them um, to uh, move on to uh, education or employment. Um, mm. So I think this is super interesting and, and uh, also, of course, relates to, to our keynote earlier here, what Anna Karlsdotter was, was presenting about our, also the Nordic perspective, because this is, uh, of course, a trend in the other Nordic countries as well, uh, as well as outside of the Nordics with, with an increasing group of young people who actually don't make it to the next level of education. Yeah. Uh, or finalize their education. So, but if we come back to the issue of how could you then make uh, vocational training more attractive, and then I guess you have to look at both target audiences, both for those who actually find it very difficult to study for various reasons, but also for those who might otherwise choose a university education which might <coughs> not lead to a job. So, so how, how would you work? Or do you have different uh, programs or, or uh, measures for these different groups of young people? Um, yes, uh, my uh, field of work is mostly young, uh, so I am not that involved uh, with what uh, with the um, uh, the students from the university and their unemployment. Um, mm. No, but if we forget about them, we, for we, we focus yeah. on the ones who are yeah. now supposed to choose whether they should take a vocational That's training right. or a university training or mm. education, so to speak. How, how do we make it more attractive to choose this track of vocational training, which actually leads uh, to, to more jobs? Exactly. And, and, and that has been a politi political goal um, for many years now, mm. but it, it hasn't entitled any, any, any variance in, in, in the way they choose. Um, there are both some cultural uh, aspects of it where it's very hard to um, it's very hard in Denmark. It's when they're 15 or 16 years old, they have to choose either um, more of the same <laughs> in a gymnasium where most mm -hmm. of my friends and the other young people they choose that, um, 
also there's a, an image in Denmark uh, amongst uh, both the students and parents that um, what they choose to do as a, um, uh, if they do not go to the gymnasium will mm. define them for the rest of their lives. Mm. Um, our education system um, has uh, can be pretty. Uh, um, it's uh, how do I say it? Uh, it's it, it's structured um, in a difficult way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it, it's it's not easy to see that if if if, if I, for example, become a carpenter, uh, I can afterwards educate me to do this or mm -hmm. go to that. Mm -hmm. uh, in Denmark, it, it looks like it's pretty locked. It isn't uh -huh. that locked. But okay. It's, um, yeah. But you create so, that feeling somehow, or the system. It makes people yeah, feel the like they're entering some kind of the, of uh, closed alleys. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. but have yeah. you have you seen or experienced any any places or also perhaps in collaboration with with the labor market where you've been able to actually engage youth and 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 increase sort of the incentives to take certain trainings or vocational yes, trainings? There is, um, there's no uh, no doubt uh, the, the the scientific uh, experiments in Denmark uh, shows that um, uh, jobs work. <laughs> Um, we have now a, a, a rather large program that um, brings uh, uh, young people that are disfortunate in some way mm -hmm. um, into youth jobs mm -hmm. when they are in primary schools, and um, and this shows uh, a significant effect, um, mm -hmm. which also collaborates with knowledge we have. Uh, but this is more um, on target. Um, also, we can see that. Where uh, in, in in regions uh, where we have uh, a lot of strong um, businesses, uh, there are uh, a lot more that chooses uh, um, the, 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 this path for them. Um, so it is much to do uh, with what pictures, what images we can bring to the to the to the uh, young people in in mostly primary schools. Um, in uh, to somehow um, um, to somehow uh, make them think differently about their uh, choice. Um, mm -hmm. In Denmark, we talk a lot now about um, I think it's called Bildung in mm -hmm. English uh, German, um, <laughs> because we ha we have had a lot of focus on numbers. We want this. Mm -hmm this group to choose that way mm. and this group to choose that way where it's become very mechanical mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about it in primary schools there's a tendency uh, to to part their ways and instead of giving uh, so if i think i i'm going to the gymnasium i don't need to interest me for mm. anything else mm. and that is that doesn't influence my choice but it also doesn't give me, as a as a as a young student, um, an image of how the whole society is structured, uh, what other ways uh, mm. that could be. Mm. Um, so we are turning more into a building um, mm -hmm. path that in, instead of just uh, trying to influence the numbers that we have to get two okay. percent more each year to to choose a vocational uh, education and perhaps you could also connect it to the ambition of the lifelong learning right you can choose exactly. several times in your life it's not yeah. uh, it's not that decisive what you what you decide as your first choice so d it sounds at least like you're a bit hopeful although the question is complex and and has been around for a long time i think that the primary uh, um, uh, those organizations and um, like uh, the industry or and the government and us uh, in coil um, and so forth we we pretty much have the same target we, mm -hmm. we pretty much have the, many of the same ideas on how to get there mm. um, which is uh, helpful a better starting starting <laughs> point that, that a good starting been. point yeah uh, but, but but there are many roads um, and um, we, we now have debates on uh, whether or not we should mm. uh, make drastic changes mm -hmm. to the whole um, um, educational system. That's what we talk about. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, the Folketing, um, mm. our uh, 
leaders are. The parliament, yeah. That's not what they're talking about. Uh -huh. So we have a lot of different ways in, uh, okay. um, in seeing this. So it's, uh, of course, it is very political, mm. uh, but it's, mm. there is a profound wish to, to, to make changes that could um, bring forth that, um, mm. that progress. Mm. Uh, we, that, that, that's not denying the need. Mm. <laughs> um, mm. So, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, for, uh, Søren, for, for, for joining the program today and shedding a little bit more light on this uh, yeah, complicated issue of how to engage with these youth that are yeah, disengaged or whatever you call them, that are far from, from the education uh, track, but also other youth that could, could benefit from a vocational uh, training or education more than, more than a university degree, perhaps. So, so let's see, and I hope that we can also learn more in the future and maybe come back to, to, to you and other uh, regions working with similar issues uh, in future studies. So thanks again for, for being on the program. Uh, and with that, I would like to just summarize uh, our Nordic tour for today and the program and uh, again uh, leave the floor to, to uh, our dear uh, research director at Noregio, Karen Refsgård. Uh, Karen, are you with us again? Could you please uh. Uh, help me with a bit of wrap up and uh, next steps? Because uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we're heading now into a new four-year collaboration program uh, within the regional collaboration in, in the Nordic countries. And uh, I'm sure that skills will be a uh, topic high on that policy agenda. So please, Karen, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. It's been a nice tour around the Nordic countries today from a top-down bird perspective, comparing different cases down to uh, bottom-up approaches from many parts of the regions in the Nordics. Um, it is true we are having a new Nordic cooperation program for regional development and planning, which are guided by the vision. And certainly skills, labor markets uh, will be in focus. Um, I think we would, I just wanted to remind you that we need to, uh, the vision is about both an environmental, sustainable, a competitive, but also a socially integrated region. So we have to consider all these aspects. If I should just reflect a bit on what I've heard today, I think that um, we've heard about the future. We heard that Anna Kalstad had talked about um, the uncertainty. It's maybe even more about what's coming. It's maybe more important than the technological change happening. What I think we'll get more into is issues around the precariat, the gig economy mm. in general. We're hearing about this unemployed, unemployed use lately here by CERN. This is uh, worrying, mm. I think, and I think we really have to be very careful about what we're doing. Mm. But I also heard what Anna said about this uh, matrix they had made where social soft skills are on demand while the more repetitive work being automated. I think this is very important to have in mind when we are thinking about the future and also within the new vision. I think that the example that... Uh, the Nordic Council contributes by providing learning across, as both Anna and Sveinung uh, emphasized, learning across. And we heard of the excellent example from Norway, the Skills Norway, where the actors at different levels and cross-sectoral are coordinated. And especially focusing on the empowerment of regional and local level for skills development. So it's tailor-made to the regions. Mm. And with that, I think what's uh, especially interesting is, of course, what we're learning from the COVID. Mm. That is one thing. It provides, we have seen some initiatives. We didn't think we were able to have not radio forum, for example, on the digit in digital events. Uh, we heard from Ortland about the flexible and creative uh, changing of one skills. The nurses be an example. Uh, and uh, 
We also heard a brilliant example from uh, integration of immigrants vocational SFI in Wermland. I thought that was very something we really can learn about mm. when we think about the future challenges. Mm. Um, I think also that what CERN brought in about Bildung, uh, the German building, and uh, in general around the uh, what's cool mm. and what the young people really want that we are presenting having an academic uh, education as the one and only. Mm. There is a lot of pride in vocational training. There could be, and I think there will be much, much more in the future with all the new types of jobs. There is an, a vast amount of opportunities in mm. the green transition, but of course mm. also in other places, but all the new types of education that will come up because we have a totally transformation of our society mm. that is called cool to take part mm. in. Mm. And that's where the regions can play an important role. Mm. Thank the you so much, want, Corinne. Yeah, I sorry. You, one more, yeah, one, more, one thing. more thing. That's the tourist <laughs> because we are turning into, we have two more events left. And one of them is the sustainable tourist mm. post COVID-19. Mm. And I think they built very nicely on both the stories from Auckland and Iceland. Uh, what are we going to do that with the tourism in the future? Mm. And also one on Brazilian and rural development. And that's happening in January mm. next year. Mm. With that, I think, for today and for a lot of inspirational uh, uh, inputs. Thank you so much, Karen. I think you uh, helped us end this on a fairly happy note and uh, quite correct. We will come back with the final uh, session of the forum series after Christmas and that program will be, will be launched in December. So more information uh, about that to come. Again, big, big thank you from me and Vaida uh, and uh, the whole Norregio team, of course, to, to all of you uh, in the audience and, of course, all our speakers. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for being part of the discussion and uh, answering the Menti questions as well. Um, recordings and slides from today will be emailed to everyone who, who registered for the event and also available on the event page on our website. And now don't miss the meet and mingle on Zoom. And again, you'll find the link in your email. Did I forget anything? No, I think you <laughs> covered it all. Thank you so much <laughs> for being this afternoon together with us. Yes. Have a wonderful evening and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.